Today I'm going to be working with a career military guy named Jeff. We are going to help Jeff diversify his income. Let's dive in. This is your show. This is the show where I work for you directly, taking your needs. I'm going through the MLS and I'm trying to find the best possible deal for you guys. Put down 25%. That's the perfect way to buy this. That's why real estate investing is the greatest industry in the world. Hey, folks, welcome to another episode of the MLS Search and Analysis Show here on Holton Wise TV. As always, I am your host, James Wise, and folks, if you are new uh, to Holton Wise TV, right? If you're just Googling stuff and you came across this, what we do is we provide you guys with education, transparency, insight into the real estate investment business. But a lot of people do that. What we do above and beyond that, okay, we actually work with you to do real deals. I am a real real estate investor, real estate broker, property manager, insurance company owner, title company owner. We have all of the pieces in place to allow you guys to passively invest in real estate, right? So we're going to start you off with that education, but then we're actually going to follow it up with real deals. I know a lot of other folks out there that just they give you this education, you buy a course or a program, and then it's like, boom. Good luck with that, bro. And then you get out into the real world and you don't know how to use these things, right? We don't do that. We work with you to do the whole shebang, right? And it starts with the education. And a lot of folks uh, to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, they get packages of this show, the MLS Search and Analysis Show. You just go to HoltonWise.com. I got them in the uh, show notes below as well, links, if you want to work with me in the way you're going to see me work with Jeff, right? And uh, we make you a series of videos and uh, put together a series of deals that we think will work for you, right? And Jeff, let's talk about you before we even get into the property, right? You are actually uh, from the far east side of the Cleveland area, right? You're out there in uh, Geauga County, interested in Lake County properties, right? Uh, <clears throat> but... You need to passively invest in real estate because you're a career military guy and you're always getting deployed and, uh, you know, you're, you're not home often, but uh, you'd like to diversify your income because eventually uh, you'd like to be able to earn income without potentially being blown up. That makes sense. I respect that, which, by the way, brother, thank you for your service. Let's see what we can do now. You gave me a whole slew of questions and I found you a property based on all the things you told me. I found you a property I think is going to work for you. We'll get into that shortly. But first, I want to just quickly run through all of your questions so I can kind of help you understand our processes. So I'm just going to go top to bottom, right? Number one, tenant turnover in Section 8 D-class neighborhoods especially. What is the average cost and is it worth it over the long haul? Well, I don't really like to put together something like the average cost, okay? That's, you know... What is the average cost? I mean, that's irrelevant, right? I mean, you know, your house is, every house is going to be different depending on how fucked up it is, right? So, like, I don't want you to just think, like, oh, if I buy a D-class property, whenever a tenant turns over, it's always $3,000. I mean, we've had tenants fuck properties up so bad, it was like a, the worst one, I think, was like $25,000. Uh, they ripped out all the the drywall. They, they, they ripped all the drywall out of the inside. They stripped out all the electrical wiring, stripped out all the plumbing, which is just totally destroyed this thing right um you know when we do evictions sometimes it's like five six seven grand it's all fucked up we got to repaint patch holes in the walls things of that nature so you know it, it's gonna vary right was that twenty five thousand dollar one is that the norm no i only seen one that bad once uh you know but sometimes the tenants move out and all you gotta do is repaint it right so uh what i can tell you is in real estate, uh, you know, a bad tenant, an evicted tenant is going to mess the house up to the point where there's probably going to be garbage in there. You probably had to pay for an eviction and you're probably going to need to go in and at the very least uh, repaint all the walls, patch a little bit of holes, um, things of that nature. Maybe some cabinet doors are broken, right? So something like that could run you like five G's. Uh, any tenant has the potential to do that. Obviously, as you go down the quality of neighborhoods, right, B, C, D, once you get down to the D range, uh, the frequency in which people don't pay rent or do that type of stuff uh, increases. So what I like to do is anytime investors are investing in D-class assets, you got to do some things to alleviate your risks. And the number one thing you can do 
is go with Section 8 tenants, right? And this is twofold, right? Going with Section 8 tenants is going to reduce your risk, right? Because the biggest risk is they don't pay rent. And then you got a victim, and then that's when, you know, nothing's good, right? If their rent is guaranteed by the government, odds of you evicting them are much, much less. In addition to that, if a tenant is on Section 8 and they're totally screwing up your house, uh, the landlord has the ability to go to the housing authority, and uh, the tenant has the potential to lose their Section 8 voucher, which they don't want to do, right? So I believe if you are going to go into D-class investing, know that your risks are increased, but the very best way to mitigate that is to only ever rent to Section 8 tenants. That's my thoughts on that. Uh, next question, should I focus on the C-class neighborhoods due to less turnover cost? Uh, you know, I, I think maybe uh, a wide... Uh, a wider range of uh, your portfolio with like multiple asset classes is probably the, the good way to do it, right? If you told me, right, you told me you want to buy, uh, I don't know if I wrote it down, but you said you wanted to buy something like eight or 10 units over the next couple of years, right? So what I would say is diversification is good, man. If you're going to try to get 10 units, I don't think you need to, I'm not going to tell you, yo, let's do 10 D class units or let's do 10 B class units or let's do 10 C class units. Perhaps, uh, you want to mix that up. Maybe, you know, I think you should probably start with the B and C, right? And then see how you like that. And then potentially, if your appetite for more risk increases, then we can move to the D. Uh, but, there, you know, there's no reason you have to do all of one kind. It's, it's okay to have some diversification in there, okay? Now, next question. I fully understand the discrimination laws when taking applicants. App I'm assuming that's, yeah, okay. Applications, got it. But what values or metrics do you use to find quality Section 8 tenants? Uh, this is very simple, and I'll put this in the show notes below. We have a full and robust FAQ. It includes uh, responses in both video form and typed form, including a full overview of our tenant screening process. So that, my man, is going to be in the show notes below. You just click that at your leisure. Next. When you have provided estimates on the show for a rehab, have you calculated an average number or percentage of how far off you were versus actual pricing? For example, can you say something like, typically my rehab estimations are within 10% of the actual cost or something along those lines? Uh, it's a ballpark, right? It's a ballpark pricing, but I've been doing this a very, very long time. I have been part of renovating hundreds upon hundreds of houses, so... My estimations are fairly accurate. Now, is it going to be accurate to the dollar? Is it 96.2% accurate? Probably probably not. I don't know. No. Uh, it's pretty damn close, right? Anytime you do renovations, the bigger the renovation, the wider the variances are going to get. That's that's one thing you need to know. Even when somebody actually goes out and provides you a line-by-line -line renovation bid, there's still going to be potential unknowns, right? You could start working on one thing. Like electrical uh, has a way of turning out that way, right? You can go in and start working on some electrical, and as you expose more things, you realize there's more work to do. So uh, what I can say to you, is you, you should put some stock in my, uh, if I tell you something's going to be like 25, 30 K, it's probably going to fall within a few grand of that. But when I do that, you know, I give you that ballpark of like 25 to 30 K, right? I leave it open like that. Now, the bigger we get, the more likely that there's could be variances, right? So if we're talking like sixty, seventy thousand dollar renovations, I mean, a ballpark renovation like that is going to vary. Now, the thing is too, when uh, we do these videos, right, my analysis of it is just step one of the due diligence process, right? Step two, you get yourself a third-party home inspection, right? So after we make the video, I'm just doing that from here, from the studio, then we actually have you send in a home inspector for, you know, two, three, four hours, and they go through everything. And a lot of times... Uh, they may find something that I didn't discuss, right? So my estimations are what I can tell here from where I'm at today. When the third-party home inspection comes out, there's new additional information. And there's a period there, you know, through email when you're working with my team and we're negotiating with the seller, I could be like, hey, Jeff, just so you know, I, I estimated a rehab budget of 15 k uh, but the inspector also noted this. I think that's going to add about 5 k to your budget, and then we can go from there accordingly. All right, let's see what else we got. 
How long does it take to get a rehab started? I understand some rehabs may be two or three months long, but if I look at a house today and we close in two weeks, how much time on average before things get started on rehab? I am concerned about the holding costs while a property waits to get rehab and refied. For that, just I'm going to direct you right to our FAQ again. It's in the show notes below. Uh, we have a full video tutorial uh, that explains the exact timelines and the exact process of our renovations. Renovations are going to vary based upon size. All of that is discussed at length in that video. So when you're done watching this video, just click the show notes below for that. If I put in an offer and it is accepted, do you have an inspector that you use or would that be on me to find? It's up to you. If you want referrals for inspectors, we can give those to you. Uh, if you feel more comfortable hiring your own, uh, that's fine too, right? Whatever inspector you want, whether it's one we referred to you or someone you have handpicked is cool with us. It's all about transparency, keeping things arm's length and you doing the proper due diligence. But yes, we can assist. Can all docs from offer to closing be done electronically? Yes, we do everything electronically. Uh, we send you all of the paperwork via software called Dot Loop. You're able to just sign right there on your computer uh, or your cell phone. However, note that if you're doing a closing with a bank loan, there are some closing documents down the road when we actually go to close that do need to be actually signed in person with a wet signature because they need to be notarized. Cool thing is notaries will come to you. So if you are deployed to another country, we can still get that done. Uh, we would simply set you up with a notary. Usually you go to the nearest U.S. Embassy. If you're stateside, wherever you're at, it's very simple, very easy to get done. You don't even need to go to uh, U.S. Embassy. Obviously, if you're stateside, you can pretty much do it anywhere. They'll come to your house, your hotel, wherever you're at, right? They'll meet you at a freaking Baskin Robbins. It's all good. If you're paying cash, though, we could do the whole deal electronically. And your last question, since I'm married, will my wife need to be able to sign at closing in person or can she do it electronically? Uh, it's going to be based on what type of deal you're doing, uh, as I just mentioned. And then my name will be the only one on title, but I believe she has to release Dower. Yes, Ohio is a Dower state. So, yes, your wife still will need to sign anything you're signing regardless of uh, you putting her on title or not. So, it's all your questions. What I want to do now is quickly... Go to a word from the sponsor of today's show, and then I'm going to get into your property, Jeff. Are you a lender? If so, Holton Wise is looking to partner with you. If you're licensed in all 50 states, go to HoltonWise.com. Click the digital media tab to advertise on Holton Wise TV today. Welcome back, Jeff. Let's jump into the first house that I think makes sense for you, my man. 22 Lakeview Boulevard, Painesville. It's been on the market for about two weeks now, listed at 129900 Now, this one is pretty cool, right? Uh, I specifically thought this would work well for you because you're from the far east side. You're very interested in Lake County. Uh, so I really wanted to start you off with something you're familiar with, right? You told me you already have a rental in Willoughby. So, you know, wh when you asked me earlier, right, should I do D-type investing? Should I do C? You know, it's not like, you know, any one thing is better for everyone. Uh, you know, they all have pros. They all have cons. But you're, you're a brand new investor, right? So, you know, I don't think there's ever really going to be a negative to walking before you can run, right? Starting with what you're the most familiar with before you get into things that you're unfamiliar with, right? So for all those reasons, I thought this would be a, you know, a pretty good property to start with. And what it is, it's the single family home that also has a huge two-car garage and apartment in the back, right? So this would be your second rental unit, right? We have a one car or a one room apartment here and then you have this big whole two-car garage, right? So we would rent this to one tenant and rent the single family home to the other, right? What we would get in rent out of each of these, that single family home, we would get a thousand bucks a month. As far as this one bedroom apartment with the big old two car garage, we would get seven fifty a month, right? So we'd be able to bring in seventeen fifty a month. As far as how that would look, right, with average estimations. Now remember, just like I told you about uh, you know, average is you know, every tenant's gonna be different, right? So know that there are variables, right? But seventeen fifty 
is what should come in. An average of 947 is what should come out, leaving you with an NOI every month of 803. But again, I got to stress to you enough, brother, that is like an average, right? So how I come up with averages like that, that is what I would expect your portfolio to look like over like a 10-year stretch if you had like 10 or 20 of these exact properties, right? Every single property, though, is going to operate independently. Every single month could be independent, right? So you have to understand that there are definitely variables in this industry. So these are estimations right if you're one of those guys that if it doesn't perform exactly like this chart you're upset real estate investing isn't for you right we're we are working with an unlimited amount of variables at all times uh, but it's a game of scale and if you scale this out this is what I would reasonably expect uh, to be your average performance okay and as far as the home itself what do you have to do to get it to that point where it's bringing in 1750 we don't have to do too too much I put a renovation budget on here of about 15 G's right as far as this kitchen goes I think the kitchen is totally fine like it's not like super updated but I don't think we're gonna have a problem putting a tenant in there for a thousand bucks the big issue is with this particular single family home what they had done is it, it it's originally a three bedroom one bathroom home but what they did is they removed a bedroom uh to make like bigger living space right it, that's stupid you never want to do that right you always get more value out of the bedrooms right so i have estimated fifteen thousand dollars of rehab budget for us to be able to go in clean everything up right uh, you know, do some painting on some walls that need some some paint, right? Like you get all the pictures like this and they all look fine and good. But when you get up close and personal, you realize it's not actually rent ready. So this $15,000 budget should allow us to put that bedroom back, uh, do some cosmetic touch ups. I'm sure as my guys are going in there for the rent ready estimates, they're going to find this or that. Like, you know, we need additional smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors. We're, we're basically just buttoning it up, cleaning it up, right? We're not doing anything major. Major. The biggest thing we're doing is putting a bedroom back, right? So about $15,000, you'll have a perfectly rent-ready property, ready to rock. And that includes, like, hardening up stuff, right? Like, right here, you got the ceiling fan, okay? We don't want to give the tenant a ceiling fan, right? That's, that's stuff we're going to be doing as we go in and we harden the unit, get it cosmetically ready, right? We'd want to replace that ceiling fan with just, like, a simple globe fixtures because anything that you have that the tenants could like hang on and fuck up, they're gonna hang on it and they're gonna fuck it up. And just stuff like this, right? Like these blinds. We're not gonna provide the tenants blinds. We make them provide their own blinds, right? Because they would go in and break these blinds and then they'd want us to fix them. Things like that, right? So we get rid of that, patch up the, you know, the holes in there. This carpet and stuff, it's hard to tell how good it is like this looks okay but sometimes you get up close and you see stains right like when you when you have the listing agents taking pictures right they take a picture like this but you know there may be like a big ass fucking stain like right here and of course that's not what they highlight in their picture right so this fifteen thousand dollar budget should be a pretty reasonable estimation of how to get your rent ready but of course after the inspection we'll get more information uh to really narrow that down for you brother and then down here just check it out just wanted to show you this we got some nice stuff going on down here just a nice empty unfinished basement uh, with the furnace that is, uh, you know, supposedly in good working order. It's probably like a 15, 20 year old furnace. They last about 30 years. Hot water tank supposed to be in good working order. They last about 15 years. Uh, updated electrical. And then here's just some shots of that little apartment. Same thing. Nothing like super impressive, but it, it, it's totally workable. And we may just need to do a, a little bit of cosmetic fixes. Okay. So all that being said. I think we should try to take this thing down at $120,000. That'd be the target price I have for you. So you buy it for $120,000. We put the fifteen in. That's $135,000 investment with our average return. That should calculate out to an 11.4% return on your investment doing a 30-year loan, right? You'd put down a down payment of $30,000, and then we'd put $15,000 into it right up front, meaning you'd have $45,000 into the deal. A bank's going to loan you the other $90,000. And that's just a solid, stable return. Are you getting rich off of it? No, but it's right in your backyard. It should be a low-risk, moderately easy investment to manage. 
and it's something that you're familiar with. So do I necessarily think this is inherently better than C or D class? No, not necessarily. I would consider this a B class, but I'm not saying a B investment is inherently better than a D investment. Yes, it's a better neighborhood uh, for quality of life if you're going to live there. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you one is better than the other, but I will tell you as you get started, it's always good to work uh, take the path of least resistance, man. Work with a, a property in an area that you're familiar with, and it's a little bit less of a stretch for you. And after you take something like this down, maybe we do a couple more, and then you kind of understand the business, understand how things work. Then if you want to take on some more risks, we'll go look at some D-class stuff for you, right? So that's my thoughts on this, Jeff. Uh, just reply to the private uh, email that we sent this to you. Let us know if you want us to write up the offer. Just let my team know the exact amount you want us to put on the contract. I recommend 120000 but it's your money, your investment. Uh, and we will send that off to the listing agent, and we'll attempt to negotiate the best possible deal for you and then get your inspection scheduled and possibly go back and forth with the listing agent on that as new information comes out, right? Like we know the furnace, the hot water tank, electrical, but we don't know anything about that roof, right? So the inspector's going to look at that roof. And, you know, if that roof needs to be replaced tomorrow, it's like a $6,000 roof on the house, let alone probably another five or $6,000 one on the garage, right? So we don't have information on that, yet, on that stuff yet at this time. That's something that will hit our budget, right? Like our renovation budget is approximately 15 k That does not account for two $6,000 roofs, right? So that's new information we'll find later, which I could then take to the listing agents and attempt to negotiate a further discount if it makes sense, right? So that's all I've got for today's show. New viewers, if you like what you saw, do yourself a solid and smash that subscribe button because Holton Wise TV is real estate investing made easy. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.